All right, we're back with Doug Rohan of Rohan Law to talk a little FSU versus the ACC here in August now. I feel like we took a little bit of a break in July, but um, we'll get right into it. But, Doug, we are officially to uh, to game month, so let's talk a little bit about Ireland first, um, and then we'll get into the juicy stuff. So if you don't want to hear about Ireland, I wore my green hat today. You can fast forward a little bit. But, uh, man, 20, 20 – you know, I, I leave two weeks from today, which is kind of insane to think about. But, yeah, we're playing ball in 22 days. Yeah, our flight uh, leaves the 17th, and we will land in Dublin. We've got a rental car. We've got a couple of hotels uh, scheduled to get out of Dublin to spend a few days exploring the country. And then we get back in town uh, to Dublin to the 22nd. And then you and I are going to be hosting a lunch with uh, a couple other groups, a couple other uh, podcasters, and we're going to be doing some live podcasting for lunch on the 23rd. Uh, if you want to sign up for the uh, news alerts and links, uh, we'll put the link below for you to get some information. You need to download the WhatsApp uh, app so that you can stay in communication with us, but we'll share that information of where we're getting together. We'll start talking about what we want to do for the game day show. And uh, you can also uh, get some supplies from Amazon ahead of time. So yeah, we'll, we'll put a link down below for registering for the Rohan Law fan experience with TJ and with Vince and uh, several others uh, that will be joining us, and look, we're really looking forward to it. Yeah, spoke with the bar this morning, so excited to get everybody those details. But, yeah, if you're, if you're in town uh, the day before the game, the 23rd, um, look out for us. We'll be doing something around lunchtime at a bar that once we get everything solidified, we'll, we'll name and, and get you that info. But if you're in Dublin, it shouldn't be too, too tough for you to get there. If you're not, then, yeah, probably going to be a long, a long lunch break. So um, let's get into it. We got some documents you know, documents. Mm -hmm. We got some strike throughs, uh, maybe a little stronger than strike throughs. Um, but we got some documents from the ACC to the attorney general of Florida, um, this week, actually yesterday, late last night. And, uh, we got a little bit of an update there, some questions there, some speculating that we'll, we'll do there and, and kind of talk some major updates, um, or maybe like kind of recap, like where, just where we're at in general. Um, and then maybe get into a few other things today, but, um, the big questions around these documents that has been speculated on for quite a bit. Josh Pate talked about the ACC or ESPN having some triggers and some levers they could pull. Um, he, he's been talking about that for a while. We've tried to talk about that for a while as well. But um, to maybe sum it all up, the grant of rights goes through 2036, and that's what all members of the ACC have signed. Um, but what we've learned or gotten confirmed over the last days, it seems like the ESPN ACC deal does not run the same length, runs you know nearly a decade shorter, and uh, it may expire in 2027, the grant of rights being specifically attached to that. Um, we, for a long time, thought that that was something that the yeah, powers that be at ESPN could opt out of. It looks like that's something that ESPN now has to opt into. They would have to opt into those last nine years, kind of like a, a player... Uh, a player, you know, agreement on a, on an NFL contract. They'd have to opt into that last nine or so years. Um, thoughts on this, just in general, thoughts on this from the uh, FSU perspective, ACC perspective, where are we with this? Well, first, I want to say I caught a little bit of flack when I tried to be uh, tongue-in-cheek, uh, casual Sunday Doug posting uh, some humor about the redacted documents being uh, shared with the AG's office and uh uh, just said, you know, here's a preview of what, what we expect to see. And of course, some people didn't didn't see it for the humor that it was. And yet here we are getting the documents last night. And it was just as I expected, about 85% redacted. Uh, so there was very little to glean from it. Matt Baker did a great job breaking it down initially. And some others have, have taken a look at it. But yeah, I did want to go through it last night. And at, at some point, wanted to share a little bit of, of what we did get out of it. It's, it's one thing to say, hey, there's nothing to see here. Uh, but but that's not true. There's always something. It might be minor. It might not be a big deal, but there's always something to get out of a disclosure like this. Uh, so the first thing that we, we saw, of course, is that the ACC took a very aggressive approach on what was trade secrets in the documents that they provided. You pointed out before we got on the air that you know the geography of the region that the contract covered was completely obscured. So we don't know if that was the Southeast. We don't know if that was the Atlantic Coast. We don't know if that's the entire United States or if it's the, the solar system. Uh, why that's a trade secret, you know, that's something that, that you have a theory on. We'll share about that later on. But it was just a reminder that uh, the ACC is really not interested in sharing 
much more information than is already out there. So we do have the, the dates. We do have this opt-in provision. We can go through them one at a time and why they're important. And, um, you know, it was just, it was interesting. The, the other thing that I shared on Twitter was the choice of law provision. We talked about why we've been fighting for uh, almost 10 months now, nine months now on the issue of where this case is going to be held. And that was because they didn't include a paragraph about where this case should be held if there is a dispute. So there was an example of that, uh, that, that the ACC ESPN contract has a New York choice of law provision. So if there is ever a dispute between the ACC and ESPN, they don't have to spend 10 months fighting about whether it's in North Carolina or Connecticut, because it will be in New York. We tried to share last week specifically on what we kind of expected these documents to confirm. And, you know, don't, it won't take too big of a victory lap, but honestly, this is exactly what I expected was for this piece of information to be made known that, you know, all the speculating, whether it was Josh paid or whether it was us or whether it was people on message boards for the last two years or whether it was people on Twitter, or whatever, there was kind of an expectation that the ACC had a chance to, or the, that ESPN had a chance to, again, opt out. It seems like it's kind of the opposite. They could opt into the agreement. Um, and that, to me, continues to be a, a pretty big sticking point. We talked a little bit about how Florida State included that in their filing, um, in their amended complaint and the original complaint, uh, that that they didn't believe that the grant of rights really was valid beyond 2026, you know, 2027, you know, being the, the first year that I guess you'd be out, so the 2026 school year. Um, yeah, let's I mean, talk, let's talk about that. Let's talk about why, why those are important and, and where we are on those documents. We'll get right back to chatting with Doug in a moment, but I wanted to tell you about our newest partner, BetUS. Football season is right around the corner, and if you're looking for a new sports book this year, BetUS is your answer. They have the fastest payouts in the industry, as well as a 125% sign-up bonus up to $2,000. There's also a 200% crypto deposit bonus. They offer live wagering on all major games. Check out the link for BetUS in the description and make sure that you bet responsibly. And we appreciate BetUS for their support of Double Fries No Slaw. We don't know what the redacted portions are. Absolutely. And, and David McKenzie was trying to give me a hard time for presuming or assuming what's in there. Uh, the reason why we can start to digest the redacted portions and compare them to the unredacted portions and all the other litigation is because of what we talked about when we first started these videos. That's candor to the court. Florida State, in its complaint, alleges certain details. It has seen these documents, so it knows what the actual language is. Yeah. The courts have all the unredacted copies. Uh, both judges have seen the unredacted copies of these letters. If Florida State were to put something in their complaint that was objectively and provably false based on the documents that were tendered to the courts, then they would lose credibility and they would get in ethical trouble for not being truthful to the court. So there is a degree of confidence that we can put in what is alleged in the complaints, especially when we marry it with the documents that we can read, the unredacted portions. So the reason why I got into it with David last night is because I was saying there is a provision that 14.1, the period where the ESPN has an without obligation has the opportunity to extend the agreement, okay? So what that says is it confirms what Florida State has previously said. We don't know what those dates are, the dates are hidden, but ESPN on its own, without any obligation to continue the contract, can extend the contract. That to me tells me that if ESPN does nothing, then the contract terminates as described in the ESPN media rights agreement. Right now, that date is 2027. And you'll see in subsequent paragraphs, the payouts are through 2027. The uh, apportionment of, of who's going to get what all says through 2027. If you compare that to earlier versions, it was to 2017, it was to 2021. So every time the agreement has been amended, it includes that recitation of all those new payment schedules. There are no payment schedules through 2036. So this unilateral extension is just the first part of what would need to happen because then there would need to be an amended contract or an amended media rights agreement 
that by my estimation and by my analysis would need two thirds of the votes of the members. So ESPN can extend the agreement. They can express an interest to extending an agreement, but based on the reading of the provisions of the contract, multiple paragraphs would have to be updated. So the simply exercising that one extension appears to me to be a unilateral step that John Swafford took to entice ESPN to stay in the deal way back in 2016 or 2017, whenever, no, it was uh, two years after 2019. So in 2021, that was the time period when they gave ESPN the additional right to extend further. ESPN should have elected their decision to extend the contract prior to August 19th of 2021. Yeah. And it was pushed out at that point is when we believe it was pushed out um, to give them that option much later. Um, Correct. Right. The, you know, which we believe now, again, you mentioned, you know, there's a lot redacted, so we can't see absolutely everything around that. But for that to be written there, there'd have to be some pretty wild language. You know, again, I'm not an attorney, so you can correct me if I'm wrong on this. There'd have to be some pretty redact, some pretty wild language in that redacted stuff to pretty much undo exactly what isn't unred, what what is unredacted, right? Like there'd have to be some stuff that's like, hey, remember when we just said that this was the case? Like, no longer is that the case. <laughs> like, just a paragraph sure. later. Like, yeah, yeah we can't. I'm see leaving anything. open the like, possibility. I'm leaving open the possibility. There's something in there I don't know, but if you look at what's written. What's written is 2027. Yeah. And, and a unilateral extension, an option, while it is by letter allowed to take place, there's no additional provisions within the multimedia right agreement that extends payments beyond 2027. So a new multimedia rights agreement would be required, approved by two thirds of the membership. Now that can happen. Two thirds of the membership excluding North Carolina, Clemson, and Florida State could approve it. If we're not out of the conference before the rest of the members approve it, then we're still part of that grant of rights. That's the second part of it that I do think is accurate. I don't think that we have to have a new grant of rights because the grant of rights, as stated now, is through 2036. So if ESPN extends the agreement and we're still members of the conference when that takes place, even though we didn't vote for it, we're still part assuming everything else is valid in the fight over the grant of rights. But that is that could conceivably continue to handcuff Florida State through 2036. That's not an automatic out. So it'd be interesting, you know, obviously, one, if you could, if you get the two thirds or not, right? So um, could you get, what are we at, 17 right now? So, you know, to, to not do it, I guess you'd need six to vote no. Florida State and Clemson likely a no. You know, our mm-hmm. North Carolina, Virginia, maybe two more. Does Miami kind of defect? I, you know, I don't know if all these teams have homes or not, but um, does NC State kind of go the same way as, as North Carolina? Does Virginia Tech go the same way as Virginia? You know, Louisville has been rumored to the Big 12 as a, as a possibility. Do they kind of – can they be sweethearted, talked into <laughs> into it? But it's certainly interesting to, to think, like, could you get enough to do it or would the other schools try and, try and lock them in? The other side of it is if they don't renew, which – at this point, you know, I'm going to ask you to speculate, but at this point, if they hadn't opt, if they had opted in, right, if they had said like, yes, we want to, we want to extend, if you're the ACC, you, you probably try to make that known as quickly as possible. Like for the, I, I mean, I would, right? Like if you, if you signed a contract that was going to maybe keep you alive, wouldn't you make that announcement? I mean, I, you know, I don't want to put thought process or marketing in their mm-hmm. minds, but it seems strange to me, or it would seem strange to me if that has already been agreed upon and um, isn't something that's being made known to solidify the conference, to quiet some doubters. Um, I don't, you know, we saw the the signage at, at you know, the ACC kickoff. That I don't necessarily know that they're the best at marketing, but even with that, I, I think that that would be something that they would announce, I don't know, to, to make it seem a little bit better or, or even say it in court, you know, like, hey, we've we've renewed with ESPN. We're, we're good to go through through 2036. And the fact that they haven't makes me think that it hasn't been done yet. And I really don't know what the motivation for ESPN at this point would, would be to get that done. But yeah, I'm, I'm thinking we, we spend all that time talking about like, well, what if they do renew or what if they do opt into the end of the agreement? But, you know, my, my gut right now says that they're not going to do that. If, if they haven't done it yet, they're, they're probably not with the uncertainty around Florida State and Clemson. 
Well, don't lose sight of the fact that this is all about eyeballs, eyeballs and money. So if there is a contentious fight that remains into the start of the football season, it's going to draw attention. ACC hasn't ever gotten more attention than it's getting right now at this moment. I'm sure their metrics for mentions in Twitter and social media is through the roof. All the engagement through these videos and the speculations. The ACC and ESPN are both very happy with this because what does it create a 5%, 10%, 15% boost in viewership numbers? Because people are talking about what are these people going to do? There's a certain percentage that are hate watching Clemson and Florida State. There's others who are like, yeah, I, I really was curious about that Clemson Wake Forest game now that we've been talking about them on Twitter all, all summer long. So on the one hand, if they're about engagement, if they're about eyeballs, they like the press. There's, there's no such thing as bad press to them. To your point, though, there is, and we're familiar with the term, you know, in recruiting, a silent commit. It's very possible that ESPN and Jim Phillips have already talked, and ESPN said, "Don't worry about it." You know, we're gonna, we're going to sign up. But yes, there's some validity to what you and several others have said on Twitter. If they were going to do it, why haven't they just done it by now? The deadline, the limit, is just the absolute final date by which they need to make the election. But they can do it any time before then. Yeah. And they would want to if they want to keep the relationship. What happens, let's talk about the other side of the coin, if they do not exercise the option and exercise the agreement, then there has to be a new contract. There has to be a new contract. You can't extend the existing contract based on just some additional terms. You have to have a renegotiation. You have to have a new contract. I think in either event, the membership needs to approve it by two-thirds. Uh, so I'm not suggesting that, but right now there's a 4.5% annual escalation clause. Those kind of terms can be extended through the exercising of this option. If they don't exercise the option, if they decide in March, yeah, we do want to continue with this. Well, if Florida State and Clemson are still there, the ACC can ar argue that there's an increase in price and that the numbers need to reflect more closely what the other Power Two conferences are getting. Not the same, but at least if they want to make a legitimate argument about being third, they want to get more than the Big 12 is paying out uh, or the, the, the other conferences. So they, if ESPN wants to continue, they can and should let everybody know that now and that would help the acc tremendously it doesn't yeah. appear that they want to help the acc yeah the uh the idea like it, it, and if they did get to if we got through february right whatever that deadline date is um february if we first. That, and and they hadn't extended does that <laughs> maybe this is for a judge to determine I mean, Florida State's argument and Clemson's argument at that point probably is that the grant of rights is no longer about, there is no grant of rights at that point. Like the grant of rights was tied specifically to that media deal. There would have to be a brand new grant of rights that at that point, Florida State could just never sign. Like we just do not grant you our rights, correct? Like even if it got two thirds, Florida State could say like, no, we're paying you our exit fee and going. Like you, your grant of rights is expired. We're, we're out. Yes, to the extent that there is a window that opens up. If we don't do anything after 2027, and it takes them until 2028 to finalize the terms of the new contract, even if we didn't sign the new ESPN contract, which, God forbid, we're still in the ACC in 2028, um, but there is a, a scenario under which an argument could be made yeah, we broke that last ESPN agreement, but we have a new ESPN agreement and the 2036 grant of rights is for any ESPN agreement. So they could recapture those rights under the existing grant of rights in a very bizarre scenario where FSU is still around as those things play out. It shouldn't. They shouldn't be. The minute that the ESPN agreement expires or even a year before, just like what happened with the new SEC teams. Florida State can pay half a year's grant of rights or a year's worth of grant of rights uh, in a heartbeat. That's that's less than the settlement uh, numbers that we're talking about. Sure. So it, it, this this does raise the likelihood, I think, that we're going to see something shortly after August 15th. I still think that nothing happens before August 15th, uh, but I don't think we're going to have to wait too much longer beyond that. I've got a general grant of rights question, not necessarily related to the documents that came out. And this might you know, kind of be Clemson's argument. I might have even asked you this before, and I know you're not 
you know, expert, expert on, on Clemson's lawsuit. But um, Clemson's argument is essentially the, I, I believe, the uh, way the contract is written, the way that it's interpreted, the way that we're reading it, the way that we agreed to it, when we're no longer a, a member, whether that's because we leave or get voted out or whatever, you, you no longer own our rights. We, we signed the grant of rights because we were a member. Once we're no longer a member, the, the grant of, we, we didn't sign that grant of rights, you know, for in perpetuity or even to 2036 if we're not a member. That was with the understanding. I spoke with somebody yesterday, and if this is a bad analogy, I, I am always here for you to kind of smack me down, but is it kind of the way you sign your insurance policy, your homeowner's insurance policy? Like, yes, I, I am agreeing that this homeowner's insurance policy is with you for, for however long I'm at this home, right? Like it kind of, if, but if I leave the home, I don't continue to owe you on that homeowner's insurance in perpetuity or, or as long as I had the original mortgage, like it is now done. I, maybe that's not the best comparison, but is that essentially what Clemson's saying? I think there's a close enough analogy here. The, the only thing I would add to it is that all contracts have an exit provision. And so in those situations, the homeowner's contract, you still have to notify the insurance carrier of the uh, date that you're leaving. Usually it's at least 30 days notice, much like the ACC requires Florida State to provide you know, one year's notice of leaving the conference so that they don't have scheduling chaos and, and network negotiation chaos. But nevertheless, I, I think the rest of it is absolutely applicable. We're not here anymore. Why, why do we need to keep paying? Now, the argument on the other side is that's the entire point of the grant of rights. And yes, in the abstract, you're right. That is the point of a grant of rights. What we're talking about is the grant of rights that was signed by Florida State. And the grant of rights was not absolute. The grant of rights was conditioned. It was limited. And unfortunately, through poor drafting, they limited it to the time period for which there is an ESPN agreement and for the purpose of facilitating the ESPN agreement to broadcast member games. ESPN doesn't need to broadcast non-member games. So if they're not broadcasting non-member games, there's nothing that needs to be done to facil facilitate ESPN broadcasting a non-member game. That's the argument Clemson is putting it forth. If there was something specifically in the grid of rights that said, you know, I designate these rights to you, member or not, through 2036, I don't even think Clemson would be making that argument, but I guess because it has been left... Mm -hmm up to interpretation, that's certainly why they can make the argument. Well, there, there is a clause in there, and they tried to close that loophole. They tried to say, uh, you know, this is in, through 2036, whether or not you remain a member. I, I think the language in there is to that extent. The problem is the grant of rights facilitates the ESPN agreement, and they did not do a good job saying this grant of rights will remain in effect regardless of who the media partner is. That was the second paragraph that should have been added to make the grant of rights what they wanted the grant of rights to be. The contract terms are read in their plain language. The judge cannot try to infer what you meant right. to do when you created a contract. It's what does the language say? The language says this agreement is for the purpose of facilitating an ESPN broadcast agreement. If there's no ESPN broadcast agreement, there is no remainder rights that stick with the ACC. So going back to the opt-in, opt-out, I asked you this you know, offline and, and want to get your take on it here um, for everybody to hear. Is there, you know, if, if what we essentially have is a, a contract through, you know, ESPN, ACC contract or, or media rights agreement that, that goes through 2027. And, and that was represented as, you know, hey, we have a contract through, you know, 2036 and, and you're kind of set there. Um, Cal, Stanford, SMU, maybe, I don't know, you know, obviously I don't know what those discussions were, what those conversations were, but, uh, you know, could, could they certainly kind of have a case of, hey, we were misled into, into signing this thing. We are going to sue the ACC to get out because we theoretically we're lied to or, or we didn't have a 2036 agreement. I mean, I guess if the, if the, if it goes away in 2027, they could certainly get out anyway, just then if, if there's not a new agreement that's reached, but, um, thoughts on, you know, Cal SMU and, and Stanford's kind of case, if they wanted to go after the ACC for that. 
Absolutely. They, they have the right to make that claim, as we've said from the beginning. You can claim anything you want. What is the evidence going to substantiate? What is the evidence going to provide? If there are emails and writings from the commissioner, from the ACC that says, you know, we're ex so excited to, to have you join our partnership and this is going to be a strong conference through 2036 because we have written agreements from ESPN to broadcast us through 2036, if that's proven false, then yeah, we have, again, what we talked about in contract terms, reasonable reliance. And so you relied upon those statements to make the business decision to join the ACC. And if that was a false statement, then you could be liable for damages to those three new partners. The question is, what is the evidence actually going to show? Uh, if, you know, not everything the ACC has done has been idiotic. So, they would use terms like, you know, we have uh, a commitment from ESPN. A commitment is not a contract. A commitment from ESPN says, yeah, as long as everything goes great, we're staying here and we're going to be part of the, the, uh, the, the broadcast group. Uh, but that's different than what the contract shows. So that's on the party of SMU, Stanford, Cal to do their due diligence, another term we've talked about from the beginning, how hard, how specific were the questions? Were those questions in writing? And what responses did they get? That would be the type of litigation that would come from something that you're describing. Let's talk a little bit about the uh, the territory. I, I've got a, I'll, I'll go pretty tinfoil hat here, and I've told you this already, but is it possible that, you know, we, we you know, when you look at the territory paragraphs that are all redacted, which is kind of funny to me if you just back up and look at, you know, from a 30,000 foot, actually maybe even farther if you zoom out. But, you know, Florida State has the, I think, the conference that's spanning the, you know, when, when you look at the fact that we go from Miami to Stanford, you know, and I know the Big Ten's big, right? But they don't get down to the south like, you know, I mean, USC, but they don't really get down to the south uh, west of Florida. When you look at the conference the span what could be on there <laughs> that needs to be redacted when you look at where the conference is now geographically you could not get any more south than they are right now and yeah i guess you could get a little bit more pacific northwest but having stanford there is is pretty high um my thought is is there maybe something in there that specifically speaks to the original kind of territory or region that the acc was was looking at or was in and kind of makes them look bad for going all the way out into the Northwest. I think that's probably exactly right. Uh, you know, it could say the entire United States. It could say the continental United States. It could say the United States east of the Mississippi River. Uh, it could say, you know, Atlantic Coast Conference means all those conferences that are in states that border the Atlantic Ocean, as it should have been from the beginning. Um that's, I think, certainly a plausible theory because what other trade secrets could possibly be in there? Nobody is going to look at whatever their geographical uh, descriptions are and, and be like, oh, my gosh, we're yeah. Fox representatives and we didn't even think that we should have described it that way. And, and what Barry does it have Arizona. anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Arizona, so, uh, that was the one. <laughs> it's, it's just something we can point to, to the comical nature. And I, again, I... I'm not political. I don't have a political dog in this fight. I'm in Georgia. I'm not a Florida voter. I'm just trying to call balls and strikes here. But this is the exact type of thing that I can point to, to be dismissive of what the attorney general was trying to accomplish and claims to have accomplished in this writ of mandamus litigation. The ACC gave the AG's office what they wanted to give it without any input from the AG's office. And they took the hearing off the calendar before seeing what was provided. That's what would normally happen. If a party like the ACC was trying to avoid the hearing, they would have rushed out to say, here you go, here you go. We're, we're giving you what we want. Please, please, please take the hearing off the calendar. But instead, what happened is the AG's office ran out and said, just give us something, anything, and we'll take the hearing off the calendar because we're running the risk of being embarrassed. So the ACC yeah. was like, all right, fine. Yeah, we'll give you the exact same thing that we've previously provided to the parties. And that's the heavily redacted copy of documents that have way exceeded the trade secrets exceptions. And I'm glad that you're going to take the hearing off so we can save on, on attorney's fees. That, that's what happened in this scenario. Give us a, uh, a quick update of, of just where we are right now. The last thing that happened was in, in Tallahassee. We, I think we're waiting still on a, on a written 
uh, it on the ACC and from Florida State. Cooper. Yeah, so that order still hasn't come. It feels like it. When the last hearing was late, uh, mid June, right? You were, you were, mm -hmm. were you camping at that point? And I was um, in the mountains. Yep, I was in New Mexico. So there is nothing that I've seen so far. Now I'm, I'm typically getting things several days after the filings are made, usually from either Matt Baker or the guys at uh, the Blue Mountain, the Big Mountain. Um, there's a couple different people that send me uh, different documents and I appreciate it. Thank you. One, one less thing I have to do. I can just wait for those documents to come in and, uh, and take a look at them instead of going and searching for them. The Florida case on a posture basis, judge Cooper is basically saying, yeah, I know we're going to the appellate court on the issues of sovereign immunity and venue and jurisdiction. I'm still moving forward with the case while the court of appeals is taking their time on an exp expedited basis to, to get to the heart of those matters, I'm not going to wait for our case to proceed. Now, obviously, we're six weeks out from that hearing and still waiting for an order. So, you know, it's not all that expeditious. Uh, but nevertheless, we could have a, a case or a hearing probably sometime in September, October on the Court of Appeals. And in the meantime, Florida is still proceeding with the case on the lower court level. By contrast, in North Carolina, Judge Bledsoe is now retiring and we're getting a new judge, a uh, new chief judge that's assigned to the case. Uh, that case has gone to the North Carolina Supreme Court via a writ, which means the Su North Carolina Supreme Court could decline to review the case if they want, or alternatively, they could schedule a hearing probably November or December. I don't think they have the same expedited calendar that our Court of Appeals does in the uh, Florida. And also the court of appeals typically moves faster than the Supreme court just because of the calendar and the terms that they have and the deliberate nature that they look through the briefs and things like that. So probably not much is going to happen this year on the legal front. That's part of the reason why you and I took a break. We weren't spending a lot of time together, you know, panting over every single disclosure that was made. Uh, but we felt like this was something that was uh, important enough to talk about today. I don't know what we're going to hear next other than perhaps Clemson and Florida State jointly announcing their departure. Uh, that's that's the next thing I'm looking for. Is it uh, six weeks without the written order? I mean, I guess that could come at any point. I mean, we kind of know what mm -hmm. that's going to be. But if we got that written order somewhat soon, um, would he probably then schedule another hearing to kind of start to move on with the case, I assume? Yeah, the next thing after that would be a scheduling order outlining when the discovery deadlines are going to be, uh, taking of depositions, uh, motion calendar dates, going ahead and putting those on the calendar so that the parties know when to prepare for uh, different motions hearings that they, they might want to submit in advance of a trial that, again, is never going to happen. Uh, but if it did happen, it would probably be a year to 18 months from today. Um, so yeah, this is, this is a very slow, deliberate process that is going to drag on for the foreseeable future. And if what we're reading is correct about these documents in a 2027 deadline and a February 1st date uh, in 2025 to exercise this option, those are two things that are going to eclipse the pace of any litigation and any definitive results that the, the courts render through a, a verdict. I'm a hundred percent speculating here and I'll, I'll let you do the same if you want. But my feeling is almost kind of like yours. Like I, you know, I, I, for a long time, I've thought that we would, you know, going back to last year, have thought that we would announce something before the 15th. My, I'm kind of moving off of that. It certainly wouldn't surprise me. We've got a little under two weeks, you know, if something was to happen, but it almost feels like there's probably more wheels turning in the background than what we're seeing. And, and whether that's Florida state and the ACC and ESPN, and I guess Clemson too, um, all kind of negotiating it together. Hey, that, you know, we're, 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 we're opting into this, but we're not going to do it until there's a settlement here or until we've got some clarity and some certainty. And, you know, let's, let's not announce anything before the 15th so that, um, you know, other teams don't jump out as well, you know, at least give us that full year. I don't know, just get, get by that date. Let's do something before football season, but here's how all the parties are probably working together. Cause I mean, they're, they're discussing stuff, whether they are close to an agreement or not. I don't know. 
Um, but it feels like to me that we could, like, kind of like you said, we could get something, you know, between August 16th and between February 1st, um, whether that's right before football season or, or right after football season, you know, kind of get through the distraction that is football season, the, the best distraction mm-hmm. in the world, I guess. Uh, but get through that. It, it, I don't know. It just to me, it feels like, you know, I'd be pretty surprised, I guess, if we were back here a, a year from now, August of, of 2025 and, and don't have some kind of clarity and again, maybe maybe that's kind of all being worked out behind the scenes, and it wouldn't surprise me if it was. I think you have it exactly right. Uh, the only thing I would add is somebody you know on Twitter was barking about you know how with this disclosure we just nothing is happening. We, we're not any any further along in the process. That's that's not how litigation works. I'm quite certain that the parties have been talking, the parties have been negotiating, uh, the parties have been discussing what a resolution might look like. Uh, I, I have no doubt that those conversations are taking place. And while these are small uh, developments, they're, they're little movements in the case, they still shape those negotiations. And as I have said, I think from our first or second video, I don't think anything has a greater impact on the timing of negotiations than ESPN's February 1st, 2025 deadline. And that's yeah. why I think that uh, there is going to be something in the window between August 15th and February 1st where we're going to have a lot more clarity on how this is going to get resolved. Yeah. Doug, tell everybody about Rohan Law and uh, where they can find you and follow you for more Ro- info on this. Rohan Law is in Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, we have been talking to several of our followers who have called us about different types of cases. Uh, I handle work accidents and criminal defense. Uh, Personally got a speeding ticket on my last trip back from Tallahassee when I was uh, driving back last weekend. Um, So it does happen. There is a speed trap down in South Georgia. Please set your cruise control for 65 and just take five minutes off your arrival time. But in the meantime, uh, if you have a question about a personal injury matter or another type of accident case, uh, I've talked now to, to probably about a half dozen FSU fans who have reached out to me through this relationship and through this experience who didn't have a question about a work accident case or didn't have a question about a Georgia case, but they just wanted help getting connected with the right attorney. I know several attorneys in the Southeast. I'm friends with many of them. I know what to look for and who the good attorneys are and, and who the bad attorneys are. So, you know, if you if you have a Mississippi case, uh, but it's a serious case with, you know, s- significant injuries and you just want some help figuring out who to hire, uh, we can come alongside you and even help you with something like that. Uh, but in the meantime, if, if you're in Atlanta and have any questions or, or need anything uh, for representation, uh, we're here to come alongside you. We want to be your best friends on your worst day. Awesome. Well, I appreciate it, man. We're, I don't know if we'll do another one of these, maybe if we announce something, but I don't know if we'll do another one of these, but if not, I'll see you in Dublin. I can't wait for it, buddy. That sounds good. See you then. Take care.